my shoes off. I had to sit there for an hour and a half with cold feet. So um, I have the shoes back on. Uh, this first um, speaker, person, woman, um, up. I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. I, I only, we only just met, like research into this person, the person. And she is a passionate role model for women in tech. She um, is inspired by many people, including Germaine Greer and Madonna. Uh, the best advice she got given, uh, which was very aligned with our investors panel this morning, was from, another, from an investor, was that entrepreneurs who start business to make money rarely become rich. And those who start because they want to run a great business are the ones that do. And I would add that to those with a purpose who really want to change something, are the ones that work. And my favorite, when she described her worth, work ethic, she said, London drag scene warehouse rave energy channeled into aggressively overachieving. Please make as much noise as we can for Alex Moss. <laughs> Great intro. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. I hope you are all enjoying South Start today. Now, over the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to teach you how to create technology like an artist. What do you imagine when I say artist? Most of you will probably imagine something like this. A lone genius working in a dark, isolated room, awaiting for divine inspiration to strike. In reality, this is what a commercially successful artist looks like. That's Jeff Koons in his studio in 2013. A-list successful artists run studio teams as serious businesses. They are much more similar to an R&D company than to the romantic ideal of a troubled hermetic lone artist. Once you take into account the large profit margin, studio team specializations, ownership of intellectual property for technical artistic production methods, the extremely high risk profile of the founding artist and management of the brand's reputation, the artist in their studio is the closest parallel to the tech startup journey outside of the technology industry. In essence, artists are in the business of inventing and executing new concepts. They do this usually once every year. So is it any wonder that they've managed to perfect the process of creativity? When I first moved into the technology sector from the art industry, I was immediately startled by how similar the personalities of tech founders and professional artists were. They both work outside the expected remits of society, are usually eccentric personalities, feel comfortable with extremely high risk levels, and have whiplash levels of ambition. To take it a step further, I found that the additional factors that made tech founders and artists extremely successful were the same. Discipline, they're trained to know how to run teams, they have access to excellent legal and advisory networks, and the willingness to stick to an unprofitable project for years, not only until it becomes profitable, but when it does become profitable, that profit occurs on an exponential scale. Tech founders and artists are, at their core, both inventors. Artists work under the pressure of consistently creating the spectacular. This cannot happen without a disciplined methodology. So how do artists manage the process of creativity? To understand this, we're going to look at a few case studies of how artists have been running their studios over the last 500 years. To give you a sense of the length of time that studio practice has been going on for, we're going to go right back to the Renaissance era. Specifically, we're going to go back to Michelangelo's studio in the early 1500s. The reason we're here is that Michelangelo was one of the first incarnations of the artist as we know them today. The mid-15th century was when the status of the artist changed dramatically from that of a craftsman producing, say, furniture or wood carvings, to an international superstar in charge of a large team. The skill set of the artist had to change alongside this. It had to change from being a technical practitioner to being a member of royal courts, 
managing an atelier, managing international patronage from multiple families and the church, and being adept at playing the political games of the day. Here is when artists are also expected to have their own style, a unique differentiator of their technique and conceptual stance immediately recognizable as an indicator of high taste. Today, we would know this as brand, although there was no word for this yet in the Renaissance. This status was not unique to Michelangelo. At the same time, Raphael was also one of the superstars of the day. In fact, the two of them met each other. In keeping with a very contemporary feel, the two had a long and very public feud with each other, with Michelangelo accusing Raphael of copying him, all he had in art he got from me. <laughs> so let's fast forward a century to the studio of Caravaggio in the 1600s. The new status of the artist has been defined generations ago, and this is the century in which we start to see the early signs of mass production in studio practice and the echoes of what will one day become intellectual property disputes. Caravaggio was the bad boy superstar of the day. Alongside being one of the defining artists of the Roman Catholic Church, Church's Counter-Reformation, he was also regularly in dispute with the Church for his shockingly violent and realistic depictions of biblical subject matter. These disputes, of course, only led to the public and patrons becoming even more fascinated with Caravaggio and producing a thirst to see his banned paintings. Caravaggio is one of the early instances of any publicity is good publicity. His work was in such high demand that he began to create authentic fakes for clients. Replicas of some of his best-known pieces, but done entirely by his studio and not by his own hand. At the same time, soon fake fakes of his work were created by other artists and sold as authentic Caravaggios. Here, questions of authenticity really come into play. Due to Caravaggio's own studio practice of creating authentic fakes to meet high client demand, he remains the artist with the highest number of fakes that enter into the art market today. Start looking out for it in the news, and you'll find that about every five years, someone has claimed to have found a lost Caravaggio in their attic. This, however, is partially true. Because of both Caravaggio's own studio, as well as other completely unrelated artists, producing knockoffs during his own lifetime, the practice of dating paint pigments to authenticate works becomes largely useless in establishing whether a work is a real Caravaggio or not. For everyone in the audience concerned about intellectual property protection and frustrated by knockoffs of your product, take some solace in the fact that this problem has been frustrating artists and dealers alike for the last 400 years. To continue the mass production theme, we're going to jump straight to New York in the 1960s to Andy Warhol's studio. Warhol's studio was officially called The Factory, which already gives you an insight into how the studio worked. As the father of pop art, his concerns were advertising, celebrity, and mass production. The Factory was groundbreaking in the allowance and encouragement of individuals outside of the fine art world to visit and work. Alongside Warhol and his studio assistants, it was a temporary working ground for visiting drag queens, pop stars, writers, socialites, and photographers. It would not be inaccurate to draw parallels between the factory and the benefits of co-working spaces, or the way Google uses architecture to cause intentional run-ins between different departments who usually would not be speaking to each other. The factory caused intentional multidisciplinary culture clashes to produce new ideas. It was then able to quickly turn these ideas around into mass-produced series of high-quality silkscreen prints, films, and paintings. Within the factory, you see clear phases of research, experiment, and the final maps production of a series of works, the most famous being his lengthy silkscreen portrait series, especially his Marilyn diptych and double Elvis. So let's have a sense of how important peer debate and studio practice actually is, now that we've gone through a very short history. In 1900, a portrait by Pablo Picasso looked like this. By 1912, a portrait by Pablo Picasso looked like this. Q 
Cubas and Moz, arguably the biggest aesthetic leap in fine art in the 20th century. In the space of a decade, the very concept of what a painting could and should be was completely overhauled. This was not a fluke or a moment of genius. This was a direct result of the studio practice of the Cubists, notably the decade when Georges Braque and Pablo Picasso worked together. They shared a studio practice to the extent that at certain points during this phase, their paintings become completely indistinguishable from one another. What magic had they found to create such unimaginable images? None. Picasso and Braque developed a clear working process of regularly attending philosophy salons in Paris and exposing themselves to imported African art, which had only just started to be exhibited in Europe in world fairs. In the salons, they went dramatically outside the concepts most artists were exposed to, notably the study of the old masters, technical draftsmanship, and color theory. And instead, they exposed themselves to new mathematical and philosophical concepts. It was their willingness to take part in peer debates and theoretical movements perpendicular to their field that allowed them to create such a wildly shocking new style. To give some context, the main two topics they engaged with were Henry Bergson's theory of duration and the emerging field of semiotics. It's also important to note that Picasso and Braque were directly working as a duo at this point, much like how single founders have the highest rate of failure compared to co-founding duos and trios, it's much easier for artists to explore new terrain and establish a studio practice with a co-worker. This allows them to have higher levels of accountability, a more disciplined day-to-day -day studio practice, and someone to debate new concepts with on a daily basis. In my work as a professional artist, my most productive times were working with a studio partner. This followed through to my experience as a technology founder. Feeling that responsibility to someone else keeps you in check from the very beginning, and it carries you through as your team expands. So let's take a practical look at how this applies to product development. Good studio practice can be broken down into seven phases. Research and noting, which usually consists of mood boards, sketches, essays, and reading. Initial tests, which really are the art world equivalent of version control, often undertaken by studio assistants, for example, for a new method of painting, or perhaps a sculpture test in 3D printing. And then there's the final design for a collection, and here's where the most amount of delegation to assistants will take place. You then go on to execute the collection, and just as you reach the end of that period, then you already start preparing for your first exhibition. You're completing new marketing materials, you've booked your set designer for the exhibition, you hand off your, to your art dealer or gallerist, and you also review any new legal documents required. Before your exhibition even goes on display, you're already researching for the next collection to make sure that you keep the momentum. And finally, the collection is released to the public. So what does it look like when you apply an artistic studio practice to technology development? To give you an example, this is how my company designed our predictive wearable capable of dual cognitive fatigue and heat exhaustion prediction, the Canaria Puck version 4.1, which we recently released last week. Research took place from both a user experience perspective and a design perspective, going out to a mine site for three days to interview a workforce. We were noting what their environment was, shadowing their full day, and doing a sentiment analysis towards wearable technologies. We established that they would appreciate something with a real-time visual alert, and were actually open to a more beautiful or different aesthetic to the very masculine, heavy industrial designs that they were used to receiving. For the design of the wearable itself, we looked to minimal modernist sculpture, particularly the way light bounced off the chrome in sculptures of Korean artist Sung Fiel Yun and the marble sculptures of Anish Kapoor. We envisioned something circular, reflective, and beautiful. For the curvature of the device, we looked to the bases of Corinthian columns. Initial tests consisted of sculpting some potential shapes out of plasticine and checking the way that light reflected off PLA plastic for 3D printing. We played around with giving the device a full foam marble effect, but ultimately decided that it didn't work aesthetically. We did, however, find that the way LED lights reflected off the gentle curvature in PLA to be successful, so we stuck with that. 
<sighs> the visual alert based on extreme temperature ended up being a really pivotal area of our design, which is why we have that circle in the middle and why so much testing went into the way that light reflects off PLA to make sure that in extreme environments, our users can always see what's going on. We also had to check that our current method of gathering biometric data was appropriate for this version. The workflow became more specialized for the final design. Our senior medical device engineer spent a few weeks testing and assembling the internal circuit board layout, whilst our head of cloud wrote our new software for the way data was going to go from our device to our online dashboard, all under the supervision of our head data scientist. Executing the collection for us meant our first run of manufacturing and assembling the version 4.1. We went through three weekly end-to-end -end tests with group critiques of our device before we were happy with it. For preparation, we drew up the new marketing materials that sold the new capabilities of our device. We organized a product launch event that conveyed the aesthetics of the device via live music and video art and put out a press release. At the point of establishing the date for the release of the 4.1, the next day we already had our first engineering meeting for the design of the version 4.2. And finally, we launched the puck at a party in our lab to clients and the press. We're in an era where the status of the technician has changed dramatically over the last 40 years. Technologists have gone from academics and coders to international technology magnates. It's useful to remember that this isn't the first time in history this dramatic change from craftsman to international superstar has happened. It can be easy to end up over-specializing in a specific field. Anecdotally, I find this to be a particular problem in the sciences. To take a perpendicular step and look to the history of art, there are a medley of practical lessons to be learned. In fact, artists have been living the startup founder journey for the last 500 years. So surely, in a time of homogeny in the startup sector, now is the time to stop creating technology like a technician and to start creating technology like an artist. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. It's really, um, it's really impressive what Alex and her team have built, and it's in Brisbane. Like, and you know, they're getting contracts and working with NASA and creating products for the world. It's really cool stuff. We can do that. Um, and I, uh, you know, I always think that um, creativity and innovation, it doesn't come from looking harder and deeper and longer at your little space. We can, we can get into that. It comes from looking outside of that and what can we draw from other things and other industries and in Alex's case from art, which is really cool. Um, next guest. Uh, <laughs> I was so delighted when I saw that this man was joining us uh, at South Star. I've known him for a while. Um, I have many names for him. Uh, <laughs> but uh, he is self-named uh, himself a weirdo, a risk-taker.